This lecture series reviews some of the many applications of radar for meteorology and also includes a short module about LIDAR. Radar is generally now used as a word itself, but is technically an acronym for radio detection and ranging. Primitive radar-like instruments were first developed as early as the late 1800s, but rapid development of radar occurred in the 1930s and 1940s prior to and during World War II, with the Naval Research Laboratory playing an important role in radar systems that would eventually evolve into usage for meteorological purposes. In this lecture series, we will review some of the fundamentals concerning how radar works, then we'll move on to discuss some specific topics related to weather radar. Radars used for meteorological purposes operate in the same general wavelength range as the passive microwave instruments we've discussed, from about 3 GHz for S-band weather radars to near 100 GHz for W-band cloud radars. They are active sensing instruments that transmit a signal and then listen to the return, or for the return, echo. This is the same principle used by scatterometers, except that in the case of weather radar, a beam traveling along some path may return back scattered power from multiple targets along its path. As in this picture, there might be two clouds, or even more targets, along the same path, and some of the transmitted signal might continue to propagate beyond the first cloud and reflect back to the radar off the second. The center frequencies for radars used for atmospheric science are denoted here. S, C, and X-band radar are used primarily for detection of precipitating clouds. We consider these precipitation radars. These wavelengths, shown on the bottom X-axis, tend to be too long to be efficiently scattered by small cloud drops, but are scattered by larger raindrops. However, of the three, S-band radar is least susceptible to attenuation, which just means that the reduction of the transmitted signal by non-precipitating cloud is minimal. KU band is also used for precipitation radar in space since it requires a smaller antenna. KA band and W band radars are more susceptible to scattering by smaller hydrometeors and are thus known as cloud radars. Their signal is highly attenuated by raindrops, but may be able to penetrate non-precipitating clouds well enough to reveal details about their structures. All of the bands are located outside of the narrow water vapor, such as this, or oxygen absorption bands, because we want the transmitted signal to be able to propagate as far as possible while also making the return trip to the radar receiver. However, absorption by water vapor increases as microwave frequency increases in this range, so cloud radar signals can be heavily attenuated in moist environments, such as in the tropics. A table of radar bands, including the frequency and corresponding wavelength range for each, is shown here. The K band is generally not used because it is situated in a water vapor absorption band. The next several slides introduce some of the terminology that will be useful when discussing radars throughout this lecture series. We will not spend much time discussing the details of signal processing and the electrical equipment on which radar depends. Instead, we will mostly focus on what happens to a transmitted signal after it leaves a radar and interpretation of the return signal, also called an echo. Collectively, the hardware involved in producing waves at the desired frequency is called a transmitter which include klystrons, magnetrons, or solid-state transmitters. An example of a radar antenna is shown here. This picture was taken in the field of the National Center for Atmospheric Research S-POCA radar system. This consists of an S-band radar and a much smaller KA-band radar antenna. Focusing on the S-band, the entire dish or a reflector pictured is approximately 8.5 meters in diameter. This is a reflector for the S-band radar, as I said, which transmits radiation with a wavelength of 10 centimeters, meaning that the reflector is about 85 times wider than wavelength of the transmitted signal. A larger reflector allows for a narrower beam width, and this particular system permits a beam width of a little less than one degree. We'll discuss the definition of beam width shortly, 
uh, and in particular in the next module, which is essentially a follow-on to this. Waves that are generated by the transmitter, which is out of the picture here, inside a trailer somewhere, travel up a waveguide, such as this and the other one over here, depending on their polarization. And they're emitted through a feed horn toward the reflector. Then the waves scatter off of the reflector and generally propagate into the direction that the radar antenna is pointing. Some other terms listed two slides previously were beam, ray, target, and echo. The beam refers to the conical area emanating from the radar that expands as it moves further from the radar. The ray, or the red line, refers to the path along the center of the main beam. The target is any reflecting object that backscattered radiation uh, toward the radar dish, and the backscattered radiation received back at the radar is what we call the echo. The range is simply the distance along the ray from where an echo is detected. The range is one of three coordinates for describing the location of radar echoes in polar coordinates. The other two are the azimuth and the elevation angles. The elevation angle is sometimes also called the tilt. A weather radar pedestal contains gears that enable the antenna to rotate both horizontally and vertically. The elevation angle describes the angle above the horizontal, which is this dashed line, at which the antenna is pointing and transmitted radiation is traveling. An overhead scan would have an, as a, or an elevation angle of 90 degrees, while a perfectly horizontal scan would have a tilt of zero degrees. The azimuthal angle is related to the horizontal direction at which the antenna is pointing. An azimuth of zero degrees generally is defined as a northward pointing antenna. Together, the azimuth angle, elevation angle, and range describe where in three-dimensional space an echo is located relative to the radar antenna. A scan strategy, which is the bottom bullet point here, refers to a usually pre-programmed set of azimuth and elevation angles at which the radar will transmit. For a weather radar, it consists of several sweeps that together are combined into a single volume of data. Scan strategies are discussed a little more in another module. A sweep, as we just talked about, typically refers to one full rotation at one elevation angle for all the azimuth angles sampled. As a radar rotates, its beam will sample an area that fills in a conical volume containing a hollow center. The red lines of this diagram represent the rays in a vertical cross-section drawn through the radar site. Sweeps can be made at numerous elevation angles. And for a typical scan strategy used by weather radar, the area in the center of the cone at the highest elevation angle is known colloquially as the cone of silence, by some at least. It is an area directly above the radar that is not sampled at all in this particular type of scan strategy consisting of several successive sweeps at different elevation angles. Collectively, all of the sweeps make up a volume, which can denote any three-dimensional collection of radar data collected within a short time frame. There may be parts of the volume where beams at successive elevation angles do not overlap, such as in here or in here, leaving gaps in the radar echoes especially at long ranges from the radar. Thus, the number and spacing of tilts used in a scan strategy determines the vertical resolution of radar data. Next, let's look at an example of gates and gate spacing, which effectively denote a radar data point and the spacing between data points along a ray. Visually, consider a beam shaded in yellow with a ray represented by the red line down the center of this beam. Each blue line represents the end of a gate. This drawing illustrates six gates. The gates become wider in this direction as the beam spreads with increasing range, 
However, the gate spacing, the distance between them in the direction along the ray is fixed, and it represents the length along the ray covered by just this single gate, for example, which is the same as the length by this single gate, if I've drawn everything perfectly to scale. Here, it is shown as the distance between the centers of two adjacent gates. The number of gates is dependent upon the signal processing hardware of the radar, and the gate spacing is determined by this and the maximum unambiguous range of the radar, which we'll discuss shortly. Like we saw in the module scatterometers, the transmitted and received power refer to the average power transmitted per pulse and the backscattered power received at the antenna that is reflected by targets. The weather radars we'll talk about are pulse radars, meaning that they transmit successive short duration pulses of radiation. The pulse period describes the period of time between those successive pulses. It is typically about one millisecond. The pulse duration, also known as the pulse length, describes the period of time during which the radar is actually transmitting the pulse. It is about one microsecond. For such a radar, in every millisecond, a signal is transmitted and reflected back to the ant radar antenna. If the pulse length is one microsecond, then the dwell time, or the time the radar is listening for return echo, is 999 microseconds. As a visual, see this example of two successive pulses transmitted by a radar. This one, and this one. The two pulses are shown in boxes as the red sinusoidal curve. The length of time during which the signal is actually transmitted is the pulse length and is contained within one of these boxes. The signal consists of a wave packet several of crests and troughs containing several wavelengths of radiation at the desired frequency in a single pulse. The pulse period is denoted as the time elapsed between the beginning of successive transmissions. The sampling rate, shown here, refers to the number of signals that can be transmitted before a ray moves the distance of one beam width. A typical sampling rate for weather radar is about 60. The power received by the radar for a set of gates is an average power over the many samples. This is required because backscattered radiation from all targets in a volume will interfere randomly. Taking a variety of samples within a short time window allows for targets to spatially redistribute within the volume, making the random constructive and destructive interference of the backscatter radiation to approximately cancel so that the radar backscatter cross-section approximately equals the sum of the backscatter cross-sections of all the individual targets in a contributing volume. To visualize this, suppose that each red line in this figure represents the ray of a different sample. In this example, the sampling rate is 7. For sampling rate of 60, imagine fitting 60 evenly spaced red lines within one beam width. This means that the average power returned at a gate centered on the middle ray, which is the black line, actually consists of some power returned to the antenna from targets outside the beam width shaded in yellow. Finally, the pulse repetition frequency, or the PRF, is simply 1 divided by the pulse period. A period of 1 millisecond corresponds to a PRF of 1000 Hz. Radar meteorologists often use PRF instead of pulse period to describe how often pulses are transmitted. A high PRF means that pulses are transmitted frequently. This reduces the furthest distance that the radar can see unambiguously because the radar needs to receive a signal from a previous transmission before it transmits a new signal in order to unambiguously know from which transmitted signal the return signal originated. The unambiguous range, therefore, is simply the speed of the radiation propagation, which is the speed of light, divided by two times the PRF, where the two is required because the signal must make both an outbound and inbound trip to and from, or from and to, the antenna. We've already discussed the wavelength and the range a bit, noting, noting the difference between range as one axis in a polar coordinate system and the maximum unambiguous range, which is a specific value of range in that coordinate system. The dielectric constant, the next variable we'll talk about, 
will be important when we, when we discuss stratiform bright bands in a different module. It is a property of liquid, generally water, or ice targets. The dielectric constant is a complex number, consisting of parts that describe both an object's or medium's permittivity or conductivity. The norm of this number will be squared in the radar equation, which we'll see in the next module. Finally, all radar meteorologists must be familiar with conversion between linear units and decibel or logarithmic units. The potential mean power returned to a radar antenna often spans several orders of magnitude. Therefore, the processed raw signal, when converted to variables related to the size of targets, are often presented in logarithmic units. If Z represents the radar reflectivity factor, which we'll talk about in the next module, then dBZ is just 10 times the logarithm of Z. Likewise, we can convert values of dBZ to Z. Note that a change of 3 dB roughly represents a doubling or halving of the variable of interest. And also know that we cannot do a linear average of numbers in a logarithmic scale. Any linear operators applied to reflectivity, such as summation, require that the decibel units are converted to a linear scale first. We'll continue with this discussion in the next module, where we'll take a look at some of these variables in the context of the weather radar equation.